So today's video is all questions that you guys asked. I don't remember how many questions I have. Most of them are about homeschool or parenting. You had a few fun questions in there. So let's just jump into it. Some of these questions you guys are hard. <laughs> like some of the questions I was like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh boy. Okay, so first question, I, I should also just say like, these are in no particular order because I record from my phone. Therefore, I'm not reading these from my phone and I kinda had to snapshot a lot of them and throw them into another document and then they got all mixed up. So some of them are from Instagram and some of them are from YouTube. So what do you do when your teen won't complete their school work or chores? This one's tough, this could be like a whole video. In fact, I would like to see that video if there's one out there. Because <laughs> I gotta say, this year has been my most difficult year with my middle child who is now a teenager. She's not motivated to get her schoolwork done. She's not motivated to do her chores. She's perpetually grounded. She's missed out on birthday parties, play dates with friends. It's almost like once she's grounded, she doesn't care. She just feels like, well, this is my life. I'm just, I never get to do anything fun. I'm just, some kids are wired very, very differently. And for me, with this particular teenager, I should say she's polar opposite of my son. When my son was a teenager, I didn't have to worry about him getting his schoolwork done or his chores. I wouldn't have been able to relate to this question until my middle child. I'm honestly trying to figure out how to motivate her and I think that's probably the thing. You have to evaluate your child and say, why is it that they're not doing this? And what is it that motivates them? What can you do to motivate them to do their responsibilities? I talk often with my teenager about the spiritual implications of her disobedience. I have to balance that as, you know, like some of us are born responsible. <laughs> some of us are born type A's and organized and, and she's just not like that. She doesn't think through consequences. A lot of teenagers don't think through the consequences of their actions. So you have to keep teaching them that but then figure out what motivates them. So I might be switching up how I discipline her. That's why I'm having trouble answering this question because I'm struggling with this myself. I will say this, if she doesn't get her schoolwork done, she doesn't get screen time, which includes TV. She's grounded from video games. I mean, that's kind of what she wants to do all the time. So it's the one thing that I take away when she's grounded. And then depending on how often she keeps getting grounded, it's so frustrating, I know. Because I don't wanna take away all the play dates and the social time with her friends because she's truly an extrovert and she wants to be around people. But that also motivates her. So sometimes I can say, well, if you do this, 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 and this, then you will earn you know, this time with your friends or whatever. So this is a tough one and I feel like I didn't even really answer it. Some of you other moms of teenagers or unmotivated students, leave, leave us a comment below. What is it that you do to motivate your child if they don't wanna get their schoolwork done or they don't get their chores done? Oh, it's a tough one. Teenagers are tough. Just, you gotta constantly talk to them about consequences and try to figure out what it motivates them. I will say this also, like with this particular child in schoolwork and figuring out what motivates her, that's where I have developed my very eclectic style now. The types of curriculums that I would choose for my son are not necessarily the types of curriculum I would choose for her because I know kind of what types of curriculum are just gonna bore her to death. And if she's like bored to death and really resistant to doing something, it's pointless to even try. It has to be sort of engaging to her or somewhat fun in some sort of way. So you might have to look at a different approach for your schoolwork. Maybe that'll help. Please comment below, moms of teenagers, moms of really hard teenagers. This is definitely one that if I ever figure out the key, I will let you all know the secrets. Okay, this next question is a long one. I'm not gonna read it all, but basically, 
How far would you go to encourage one of your children in their personal interests? For example, would you let them watch the documentary on, on Dahmer on Netflix or some other movie or show? So she was saying, for example, they canceled Netflix because of the types of things that were on it or because they got it free with some phone plan and they canceled Netflix, but then their daughter went to the grandparents' house and watched a documentary on Jeffrey Dahmer, or maybe it was a series, and came home super interested. The daughter is interested in criminal psychology and wanted to watch it with the parent. The parent is questioned about whether or not that sort of documentary is appropriate. I don't know. <laughs> I tell you, you guys ask such hard questions. I don't know. I guess, I'm, and th that's a case-by-case Thing. I've never had a child interested in something that would have sensitive material like that criminal psychology. I mean, I have a child who's interested in technology. It's kind of hard to give him free reign with the internet and learning about things on YouTube when you know that there are questionable things out there. On the other hand, they are probably at some point going to be exposed to something that you don't want them to be exposed to and you need to teach them the value of guarding their eyes guarding their ears when to say no because you can't unsee things oh she's a teen i don't know anything about that particular documentary if there was like nudity in it or if there was a lot of foul language i definitely don't think i would let them watch it there's other documentaries about criminals and, you know, 2020 specials and datelines, all kinds of that sort of thing that you could watch that might be of a more appropriate material. So I think it depends on the content that that particular thing is and the sensitivity of your child. I have some children who like, for example, could watch the Indiana Jones movies when they were younger, but my third child is very sensitive and doesn't wanna see anything gory or scary or anything like that at all or she'll have nightmares. So I think some of that would have to go into it. Okay, now that I've thought through this, I would not let my teenager, I would not give them the okay if it had, if it would be rated R. <laughs> unless the rated R was only because of violence and I thought that they could handle it like if it was a war movie like War Horse I only saw that movie one time and I will never watch that movie again because I was sobbing the whole time <laughs> something about animals it gets me every time I wouldn't be giving my children free reign towards any sorts of inappropriate material just because it might have something that they're interested in surrounding it. Again, I don't know anything about this particular series, but it reminds me about the world in general and how everything is art, right? So now you can have just like this Balenciaga thing that has come to light recently and some of the things that they've found out about some of the people involved in that and the art that they're into, which is heinous and sick but anything goes because it's art I would be cautious about anything goes because well it's a learning opportunity about criminal psychology so I think there is all kinds of learning things you could let your daughter dabble in regarding criminals without it being inappropriate material if that's what this Netflix thing actually is so I hope that helps Next question was about Brave Rider. How is Brave Rider going? I'm not gonna answer that in this video because I am gonna be doing a mid-year update probably in January, so stay tuned for that. I will let you know about all the things we had planned and how it's going, and spoil alert, my year did not go as planned. <laughs> Surprise, surprise. I feel like I'm always buying things to feel adequate for my son's learning because I am new at teaching him at this rate. It will take forever to have all the supplies and additional things to the curriculum. Is there a way to avoid that? Yes, there's a way to avoid that. What did the pioneers have to teach their kids? You don't need every single thing suggested in order to teach your kids. So if you're choosing a curriculum that is requiring you to buy all sorts of other things, 
then maybe that's not the curriculum for you. There are simple curriculums out there that are very cost effective. So I'm not really sure, and you know what, I didn't look at all the replies here, because I think I did reply. I'm not really sure if you're just talking about school supplies, but there are also Facebook groups, there are all kinds, there's eBay, there are all kinds of places out there that sell used curriculum and used supplies. I'm always looking for a sale, you know, Black Friday sales. If you would have figured out, say in October, what curriculum you might wanna use for the next year, you could get a Black Friday deal. A lot of curriculums have things on sale in February and March because they're trying to get you to buy sooner. I would say don't feel pressure to buy everything that's suggested and just think about is there a way that you could do this cheaper. So for example, you don't have to buy little teddy bear math counters. They sell those. They're teddy bears. Could you use pennies as math counters? Yes, you can. Can you use a bag of Skittles to teach your preschooler how to count? Yes, you can. You don't have to have the fancy counters. Even like some of the math manipulatives like a scale. Do you, do you absolutely have to have that in order to teach? No, you do not. So I would say if you're worried about money, pare it down, simplify. And if you have to search for a more simple curriculum, do it. You know what? Also, another thing in my area, and I would assume all kinds of areas, there are a way to connect to local homeschoolers. And where I live, there are all kinds of homeschool they're like grad sales where the, the local homeschoolers are selling their curriculum and selling all their math manipulatives and all of that stuff at grad sale prices. And that is honestly where I have amassed a lot of my collection very, very cheaply. So if you're not connected to a local homeschool group, see if you can figure out where, where one of those might be. And you can probably score stuff at grad sale prices there. What do you do if you have a ninth grader and are way behind since even pre-COVID stuff? How do you catch up? Not sure if he will want to go to public high school or not. You guys are asking me such tough questions. Can I just say, like, I am not an expert. I am a mom with opinions. <laughs> so these are really, really tough. If I had, and you know what, I actually probably have this because I have a daughter in junior high who is probably not at junior high level in some of the things. But my first question is behind by what standard? Because I honestly don't know what high schoolers, what, what level they're at these days, because I know this, I know colleges are courting homeschoolers. So kids in high school they may know how to take tests but that does not mean that they know how to learn and that's the unfortunate that's the unfortunate reality we have here honestly the only thing that I could think of where your student might not be caught up to go to a regular school might be math but the high schools that I went to had remedial math had intermediate intermediate math and had accelerated math programs so there are all kinds of students who enter high school who aren't at the same level as some of their peers. So I wouldn't worry a whole lot about it. I would, if you really think that you have to send your kid to school, I would have a talk with the school about it. I, I really can't help you without knowing all the specifics. But if you're really more thinking about, well, you want to get them caught up because they might want to go to college someday, then I would say this. Public school requirements for most states are really low. You guys, the bar is low. The bar is really low for most states. One of our states, because I looked at all of them one year, I think it might be Tennessee. Maybe it's not Tennessee. I can't remember what state it is. They only require 13 credits to graduate from high school. To get your GED, the bar is low. To go to college, the colleges are not necessarily gonna care a whole lot about your grade point average. They might a little bit for scholarships, but they're gonna care more about your ACT scores or your SAT scores because grading is subjective even in the public school. You'll have teachers that are really restricted at grading and you'll have teachers that pass you because they like you. So the grading and and grade point average, if you have a 4.0 but you got a 15 on your ACT, the college is gonna say, hmm, 
what do those A's really mean? They really don't mean a whole lot because look how they did on the test. So if you're thinking more about going to college, then I would suggest that you look into test prep companies and I will link the one that I know of below called Better Prep Success. Jason Franklin, he's local to our area so he holds live classes, but he also has online classes. So throughout the nation, he has helped students learn how to take tests because whether it's the ACT or the SAT, a lot of those kids have test anxiety. And so he teaches them strategies for taking tests and he also knows a little bit about those tests and how to take them. And you just practice, You, I think what he does is he helps them practice taking tests so they know what to expect, know how to pace themselves, and know the little tricks, hints and tricks to look for. And if you even look on his website, he's had many, 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 because I've known this man for years, he's had a lot of students who may be the first time, for example, the ACT, they got in the lower 20s, they took his class and they scored 30s. So his class has helped people improve their test scores a lot of points and I don't know about you but when I was in high school I took the ACT twice I did not have a class like his and my test score improved one point which is what most people do without changing anything if they just start retaking tests they're not going to improve a whole lot but his class and the strategies that he teaches actually make a difference so if you're looking at college I would suggest looking into something like that all right finally an easy question <laughs> My question is, do you change anything up for the holidays, fun traditions for your family that you have around this time of year, either free or inexpensive? I absolutely change things up for the holidays, especially December. I always have plans on continuing things like math and some sort of writing, but everything that we do is around the history of Christmas or reading something Christmas related. And then we do a lot of baking. We do a lot of life skills, wrapping presents, decorating, time management, preparing for, you know, whatever it is we need to prepare for, for the holidays. I've done a video on the Christmas unit study, this book I love on the history of Christmas. We've done this book for three years and my daughters don't wanna do anything new because they love this book. I just did a recent video about a really fun game that we always play called To Bethlehem. This game was created by homeschool dad, Todd Wilson. It is Christian based, but it is really about family bonding and getting to know your family. And it's really fun to play with grandparents because it has questions in it that get at like their childhood, their hopes and their dreams, or their favorite parts of Christmas. And you really, you get to just share in the fun of the season, but you're also learning about each other. So that's a fun tradition that we have. And then of course, just like every other family, we go and we look at lights. If we go look at lights, in the past I have gone online and found some scavenger hunts for us to do with lights. So for example, on a scavenger hunt might be a house that has the Grinch in it or a house that has only white lights or a house that has a Santa Claus somewhere. So little things like that. Another fun tradition that we have at Christmas time is I usually look up old movies that are playing in the theater. So we have gone to see It's a Wonderful Life in the theater. This year we're going to see White Christmas in the theater. It's just, even though we've seen them and we have those on DVD, it's always fun to see it on the big screen. And we always invite grandma, so we're creating these traditions with my mom um, and we make it like a girl's night out with my daughters and her, so that's kind of a fun tradition. Maybe you've said this before, but what Christian denomination are you? This could be a really long answer, you guys, because I am not part of a Christian denomination. My church is non-denominational and intentionally so, and um, I know that organizations have good intentions when they declare a denomination because they're really saying, well, I believe this and I believe that, but so many denominations have such variation in them, it really doesn't mean anything. Honestly, if I said I was Presbyterian, you would probably still say, well, okay, which kind of Presbyterian? The kind that in their hymnal want to take 
in the Christ Alone song. They want to take out the part that on the cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Is that the Presbyterian you are? Or are you the Presbyterian that wants to keep on the cross that Jesus died, the wrath of Christ or the wrath of God was satisfied? So see right there, Presbyterian, completely different. <laughs> so what, is the, what do these denominations really mean? What you really want to know is what my theology is, right? Um, here's what I really want to say is, I am determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. There are some verses in one of Paul's epistles where he says, you guys were arguing about, well, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos. And that's where Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I'm not going to take on the name of a man. I mean, look at how many people argue over Calvinism versus Arminianism. Like, what is the truth of Jesus Christ? By saying, I'm, I don't know. I just, the labels that take away from Christ, that part bothers me. So I am non-denominational. The preachers that I like, John MacArthur, Vody Bauckham, Paul Washer are probably my top three. I know Vody Bauckham is reformed. I know John MacArthur is independent, right? <laughs> I'm neither of those, okay? I also listen to Alastair Begg. I've listened to Albert Muller before. There are things that R.C. Sproul says that are encouraging sometimes. There are things that John Piper says that are encouraging. I would not put myself in the John Piper camp, however. So I'm not a denomination. I am trying to become more and more Christ-like, and Christian is my denomination. And I am always learning and coming closer and closer to the knowledge of the truth. That's the thing, too, about like denominations is it says we believe this, 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 and this. And while there are certainly things that I believe, I... If you want to show me differently in the Word of God why those things are wrong, I'm going to have an open mind. I might listen or I'm going to defend why it is that I believe what I believe. But you can bet, bet you this. If it's important, I know exactly why it is that I believe what I believe. So, so there you have it. I'm a Christian. And then the, this same person also says, have I tried campfire curriculum? No, I have not. <laughs> I almost bought a Christmas unit again. I don't know what's holding me back about it. I think I think what's holding me back about it is I don't want to spend money on something that I'm just still not sure about. I don't know. I watched the, the video of the new Christmas curriculum that they had about the hymns, and I thought it sounded good. But then I asked my daughters, do you want to learn about the hymns, and do you want to do this, or do you want to do the history of Christmas again? And they said they want to do the history of Christmas. So... I, there are still, I'm not like putting campfire curriculum like out to pasture. I'm not saying that I would never use it. I just, I just haven't bought it yet. I haven't, I don't know why. Have you gotten enrichment more into focus? So I talked about this with the Brave Writer lifestyle. They talk about doing enrichment things like watching movies, Shakespeare, art, all those fun things, poetry tea time. I haven't done one single poetry tea time this year. I think poetry tea time is a lovely idea. I love poetry. I love reading poetry. I love writing poetry. I, it hasn't happened this year. This has been a whirlwind of a year and I can't even believe it's December right now. We, we watched some movies, haven't been to any plays or anything. So I'm, I'm deeply, probably deeply failing on the enrichment side. All I can say is my teenager is really giving me a rent for my money this year and I've just had a lot of wrenches thrown at me. Having said that, I am enjoying this school year. So there you have it. I have been doing read alouds a lot more than I ever have in the past. We've gone to the gym a few times and I signed my daughters up for dance this year and they were also signed up for a volleyball league, which they had a lot of fun with. So is that enrichment? I think so. All right, somebody said, what curriculum did you use for kindergarten? I used my father's world for kindergarten for my middle child. I loved it, especially if K 
kindergartner is your is your oldest child or you still have a young one i thought my father's world for kindergarten had a lot of creative ideas a lot of fun ideas it only took about an hour hour and a half tops it was very easy and manageable but when my youngest child came along i had i think my son was in sixth grade whatever grade my middle child was at at the time and you tend to have to focus more on those older children, especially at that age. I kind of, for her, just focused on math, which I used Singapore math. Highly recommend. That was really easy. And I let her do as many pages as she wanted. And then I just focused on teaching her how to read. I think I started her on like Dick and Jane books and just some readers and teaching her some early phonics. I don't remember using a formal program though, to be honest. And then... I really, I did that video about the things that I wish that I would have done differently, this mom guilt video, and I sincerely say this, for kindergarten, for all these young ages, if your kid is thirsting to learn and you want to use a preschool curriculum or you want to use a kindergarten curriculum, go for it. If, if you have a hungry learner, a little hungry caterpillar, go ahead and do it. But if you can't fit it in, like if you have a lot of other kids and it's really difficult for you to do a blown out curriculum, you don't need to. Just pick a math curriculum and get something to help teach them how to read. That's really all you need. And then they will kind of glean from what the older kids are doing too. So at that time, my daughter, we were also in classical conversations and so she was memorizing all the memory work all the math songs, all the science, all the geography. She was still learning all of that stuff, even though it was like way above kindergarten level. But reading, writing, and arithmetic is pretty much all you need for kindergarten if that's all you can do. Oh, finally an easy one. Do you prefer coffee or tea and how do you like them? I like coffee and tea, hot. I do like some iced coffee. I do not like iced tea. I do not drink them sweetened, none of them, unless I'm getting like a latte or a white chocolate mocha or something like frou-frou. I call those the frou-frou coffee drinks. And of course they have milk and sugar in them, but I drink my coffee black. I like flavors in my coffee. I generally, if I'm not gonna drink flavored coffee, and when I say flavored, I mean like mint chocolate or white chocolate flavored coffee, then I'm gonna go with a dark roast. And for my teas, I like hot tea, and my absolute favorite hot tea is peppermint hot tea. And Trader Joe's sells an awesome peppermint hot tea. And Trader Joe's also has an awesome pomegranate and hibiscus tea. So if you like a semi-fruity flavor, that is a really nice tea also. Thoughts on hybrid schools? I'm not sure hybrid meaning part homeschool part school school anything any school you're going to be a part of the parents i think as long as you know what your goals are why you're doing what you're doing you're not neglecting discipleship and you're heavily involved in what it is your students learning and you are the main influencer in your students education then i don't see what the big deal would be because ultimately parents you are accountable for your children's education no if ands or buts about it what do you use to keep track of grades for transcripts and okay so this person's having trouble how do you decide which assignments to grade to record well I think like for transcripts for high school, grading is subjective whether it's in your home school or whether it is in a modern day school, a public school or a Christian school. The only thing that's not really subjective is if you're grading on facts or like a translation of foreign language or math. But if you're grading papers and you're grading like how persuasive were they, that's very subjective, right? So how do I keep track of the grades? I have a homeschool planner that I'm using right now, this plum paper planner, um, but I, I last year used a spreadsheet. I, I keep saying that I'm going to do a video about this, but um, I don't do videos unless I feel super confident in what I'm doing, and I don't feel super, super confident about this being my first high schooler yet. So 
This year I'm keeping track in my planner how I've decided what to keep track of. Well, his math is all kept track of online. Like I'm not grading it. We do Shorman math. It's all online. It's like teaching textbooks in that they teach it. They give the tests, they give the quizzes, they give the grade. So I don't have to do anything there. Compass Classroom History, I am only grading whether or not my son did the assignments and I will grade him on his basic understanding on the weekly tests. And then there are special projects which they give you grading sheets for and they tell you how to grade that. So that makes that part easy. When I did the Good and the Beautiful Language Arts last year, they also like told you how to grade it. Um, for papers and stuff, you have to decide whether or not you're really going to be a stickler about grammar or if you're just grading the content of the paper. Those might be separate grades to you. It depends on what the purpose of the assignment was. For my son's Latin this year, I'm only grading whether or not he did his homework but I'm not grading the homework. I gave him the answers because I don't know that. So when he's translating, for me to look at his Latin translation, it would take my brain forever to look at the spelling. It's not like, you know, when I look at the English word cat, I see cat right away. For Latin, I see gibberish. So I don't grade his, his weekly homework, but I do grade his quizzes because those are multiple choice. So he gets like a participation grade for doing the homework and then he gets an actual grade from his quizzes. Science is pretty, our science is pretty straightforward to grade. I'm, I'm not too like overly worried about his transcript because again, like I said earlier in this video, if he goes to college, the colleges are going to be more concerned about ACT scores and SAT scores and then also the things that I might put on his resume like the volunteer work that he does, the things that he's participated in, extracurricular activities. And like my son had a job this year. So those sorts of things are going to show how more well-rounded he is and whether or not he's going to get a scholarship. You know, a lot of times scholarships, they're not even necessarily determined by your grades. They might be determined by an essay that you write or by financial responsibility that you show or something like that. So. Grades are subjective, you guys. You probably remember this from being in high school and in college. I'm, I'm not kidding. I had a professor in college one time. I took a test and I had no idea what I was talking about. And I just wrote a lot of everything that I knew. And I, it's hard to explain this except for one of my peers got a lower grade on his test and he knew more about the subject than I did, but because I participated in class and the teacher, the professor liked me, I got an A on my test and my peer got a B. So <laughs> that's how it is in high school too. The test scores, the ACT, SAT, that's really gonna hold more weight than your GPA. So my opinion is I'm not going to stress too much about it. How do you handle mornings for your kids? From getting up to starting school, we've got a pretty good devotional morning commitment going and then I like to allow them some personal time and me too, but it's been hard to reel them into school mode and I don't want to be I don't want it to be so difficult. I got to say morning is difficult for us as well because my kids will not start their schoolwork unless I say, okay, guys, time to start. Like, come up, let's do stuff. There are some kids that are motivated to get up early and they start their schoolwork right away because they want to be done before lunchtime. That ain't my kids. My kids will go downstairs and they will want to watch YouTube. My kids are motivated to get up early so that they can watch something they want to watch on YouTube or watch something on TV before school starts. I usually have to call them to the kitchen table to start school. So really the start of school is, is all on me and when I'm ready to start, I have to be consistent about it. I have one child who does not get out of bed on her own very well and a lot of times she has to be woken up. I tried to tell my kids like if they're not ready to start school at 8.30 when I want to start our Bible time, see we do Bible time together and we do our personal 
time with the Lord. Like I start it with, I set a timer for 15 minutes and we have quiet time at the table, but we're all together, but we're all doing our own little personal thing. But I try to tell them like, if you're not ready to start school by 8.30, you do not get video games at the end of it. So again, what motivates your kids and sets clear expectations in order for you to get this, you have to start school on time. You have to have a good attitude all day. You have to have good participation and whatever else is your challenge. And then if you do that, you can play video games at the end of the day, or you can watch TV at the end of the day, or maybe you know you can have some sort of reward system where you get a star at the end of the day. And once you collect five stars, you can have a friend over, you can go to a friend's house, or you can um, have pop if you don't let your kids drink pop and that's special. I mean, whatever it is that motivates your kids, that's kind of what I do to try to set expectations for them. What would be a perfect day date for you and your husband? I'm not gonna joke, I mean, I'm not gonna lie. When I first read this, I started laughing because I thought that would be April 27th because it's not too hot, it's not too cold. All you need is a light jacket. <laughs> Comment down below. If you knew what I was talking about before I tell you, that was from Miss Congeniality, which I think is one of the funniest movies. Every time I watch that, I'm like, I forget how funny this movie was. Um, a perfect day date for me and my husband. A perfect day date for me and my husband would be obviously to go out with no kids, but also to go to a restaurant that's not a franchise or or is not something that's very common. So for example, there's been times where we will drive to the Chicago suburbs because we can go to the suburbs for the day and get back home within a day. Um, so we might go to a restaurant that, up there that we don't have and do things that we don't normally do. But I also like if the weather's nice outside, going someplace for a hike or walking around the lake and just being outside and enjoying our company is all I need. I don't really consider running errands going on a date. There are times where my husband will take me shopping and he's a very patient husband when it comes to like me shopping for clothes. He's the type of husband that would sit in the chair for hours and let me do whatever I want to shop for clothes. So he's taken me to the Chicago suburbs to do that before too. But the older I get, the less and less I want to shop. <laughs> So I wouldn't say that's a perfect date anymore, even though that's what we did on our very first date ever. We went to the suburbs and went shopping and ate at P.F. Chang's. That would have to be the perfect day date because a perfect date in general would, be, would involve like going on vacation. <laughs> what are your future dreams? <laughs> okay, well, I guess like right now, honestly, because I don't want this homeschool thing to end and I see my kids growing up and I don't want them to leave the house and I would really love to have another baby around my house or another toddlers to keep the dream alive. I guess right now my future dreams are I'm dreaming about being a grandmother someday and hoping that my kids will homeschool their kids and that somehow I will be able to be involved in the homeschooling of my grandchildren and doing all the read alouds to my grandchildren and all the special things that I would like to do with my kids now that I feel like I don't have time to do because I'm constantly trying to fix dinner or clean the house or you know do those regular chores but when you're a grandparent and those kids aren't around and you've got like a lot more time to plan out special things like I am going to be the best grandmother the most fun grandmother in the world and that is what I'm dreaming about right now <laughs> okay what things do you do to stay connected with your high schooler first of all my high schooler is involved in every single morning time that we have and we spend at least an hour if not an hour and a half together every morning in the Bible doing a Bible study we also play board games together to start our day on Fridays and occasionally if I feel the whim we'll play another game another time of the day. I do our little family co-op every other Tuesday if he's not working. And so we do something 
together, a learning activity together then. And then on Fridays on a weekly basis, or at least I try to do it on a weekly basis, I have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with my son and that's where I grade his Latin work, I go over his paper, which if he has drafts of papers, he will bring those to me during the week for me to check and we'll talk about it. But that Friday meeting is really where I grade the work that I need to grade. We talk about the book that he's reading and any discussion questions, anything that we need to go over. So he just started the Dave Ramsey personal finance course, so we did an activity, talked about that together, told him all the things that I was never taught about managing money, that I wish somebody had taught me about managing money, and told him how I would do it because I'm determined that my kids are not going to make the same mistakes I made. We also do a lot of day trips as family. We do a lot of family outings. And, you know, homeschooling in general is such an awesome way to stay connected to all of your kids. I don't feel disconnected with my high schooler. What an awesome feeling that is, too. What do you do if your kids don't get all of their subjects done for the day because they were messing around? Do you have them work on some at night or weekends? I have one son that is slow to do everything and is really distracted. I have a daughter that is exactly the same way and I'm reevaluating what I might do for her because I recently watched rewatched a video by the channel 7 and all, Rachel from 7 and all. Her mom was on there talking about homeschooling the strong-willed child and her sister on there who was the difficult child was on there talking about how she did get her schoolwork done. It was just like at 8 p.m. at night. It wasn't when everybody else was getting their schoolwork done. And it just kind of got me thinking like, hmm, should I just let my daughter get it done on her time frame, but just have it so like you can't watch TV, you can't do certain things, the fun things that you want to do though, until your schoolwork's done. Like, I'm reevaluating that. But my high schooler, if he doesn't get his schoolwork done, he works on the weekends. He does that on his own. I have told them, hey, when I was in high school, I had homework. And sometimes we had to work on the weekends. Sometimes that's just how it is, especially if you have a project that you're working on. My high schooler has deadlines. He's got to turn things in at a certain amount of time and he manages his time. I really don't have to manage his time for him. But it's that middle child. I feel like I'm constantly nagging her, but I definitely, they're not allowed to just stop everything at three o'clock and say, oh, school day's done, even if I didn't get it done. They have certain chores that they have to do every day before they can watch TV or before they can play their video games and they have to have part of the, those chores is having all of your schoolwork done. So you will lose privileges. Like let's say they go to bed that night and they never got it done. Well, then they're grounded. <laughs> and the grounding might be no video games for a week or no play dates with friends or you can't go to birthday party. That's how we do it. Are you still totally over gather round even if it's paired with a full language arts curriculum? And the answer to that question is yes, I am over gather around. The thing is, is I'm one of those people that with companies and products, if, if I had a bad experience or an unsatisfactory experience, it's going to be really hard to get me to come back. I mean, <laughs> there was this, re like for example, there was this restaurant my husband and I loved to go to with our kids. It had fantastic food, but there was one time that I went there where I sent my food back because the chicken tasted like it was a frozen chicken breast that they tried to roast and pass off as this gourmet meal and it was it was not even edible like cutting it with a knife was like cutting a really hard piece of rubber that I couldn't even get the knife through so I had to send it back and when they brought it back to me it looked like the exact same thing and and I loved that restaurant but once I had that bad experience, I was like, I'm never going back there again, ever. They are never going to get my business again. And I'm, I'm not saying that I had like a totally bad experience with Gather Round. I think I just got enough, a taste of it enough where I was like, this really isn't us. The, the reading material of it, it was very textbooky to me and my kids didn't really enjoy it that much. I would rather read living books and learn about things that way. And I just liked 
like for example the science I just like how the good and the beautiful reads to the kids better I just I like how that's laid out better and I don't even do the good and the beautiful science for all of our science I, I kind of mix up all of that so I've just gotten more comfortable in certain things saying I don't even really need a curriculum all I need is good books so gather round also just in my opinion was very expensive so if I have to do all the planning and I have to do all these things and pair it with a language arts curriculum, then yeah, I'm over gather around. I'm not, I have never been tempted to go back. If I'm gonna do a unit study approach, I am more tempted by campfire curriculums. And just like I said at the beginning of this video, I'm not even sure why I haven't even tried that yet. I honestly think I haven't tried it because my middle child is so unmotivated to do so many things right now. She's just such a challenge. I don't want to spend any more money just to have her be like, I don't wanna do that either. Do so. I look different? I should. I recorded all the questions and then I had to be somewhere and realized I was like flipping through my pages. I missed four questions. Okay, so I thought I have to do these and I'm just gonna have to look different. That's just how it is. What are your favorite homeschool curriculums for each subject? I don't think that I have favorites for each subject and I'm being really sincere when I say that because I use different things for different children and whatever those children's needs are. There's all kinds of curriculums that I've used in the past that I thought were great that I don't use now. So this would be really, really, really tough for me to answer. And it also depends on the age of your children because elementary age subjects are gonna be different than high school and what I love. So I think pretty much everything that I've ever loved, I have some sort of YouTube video about it or talking about it, but I guess I will try to briefly go through here. For science, I love the good and the beautiful science. For history, I've heard of all kinds of great history curriculums, but my preferred history, honestly, is just read alouds, like the missionary stories that, that we're reading, or historical fiction, and talking about what it was really like during that time, and then also watching documentaries. So I did a video on how to create your own history curriculum. That is definitely my preferred way to do history. Even like for Bible studies, I can't say that I have a preferred one over another, but I have this whole list here of teaching your kids biblical discernment. So there's all everything in this list I love. For language arts, that is so tough. So I have used Explode the Code. I think that's a solid program that's very easy to help teach your kids phonics. And it's also very independent. So I love that one. Truly, I actually, I really do love the Classical Conversations Foundations program, and that would include like geography, history, science facts, math, and their Essentials program also is really, really, really good. So I actually love Classical Conversations, even though we don't do it anymore. I think the Good and the Beautiful Language Arts is also a really great curriculum. I am not a huge, huge fan of the way that they teach writing, but that is because I prefer the way that IEW teaches writing. I ha I'm dabbling now in Brave Writer. I like Brave Writer for the creative projects that they have, but I can't say that like for teaching the process of writing that Brave Writer is going to excel over IEW. They are like apples and oranges for writing curriculums. I like the Lost Tools of Writing. I did a video about that. and um, But that is for older grades and that's great for teaching critical thinking and persuasive writing, but it's a fantastic program. If you have a struggling speller, I found a reason for spelling, which I did a video about a reason for spelling. That one worked much better for her, but it was definitely a lot more focused. So that spelling curriculum was more intensive when it came to spelling. And we also use spelling, spellingvocabularycity.com to help her practice because she just needed a lot of practice. Your child may not be like that. You may not need all of that work for spelling. For math, I really like Singapore primary mathematics. And I just, I think the way that it teaches math is awesome. I have used Saxon math, but Saxon is not my favorite. 
and that's just because of me. I mean, Saxon has proven to be a results-oriented program. It just personally is not appealing to me because I think it's really boring. <laughs> For upper-level math, I like Shorman math, and Shorman also can, I think he has a pre-algebra program, so you could start Shorman's actual math program in junior high, but Shorman also has, he will also like teach using a Saxon curriculum. So there's lots and lots of options. I, I can't say that I have a favorite. <laughs> there's so many good curriculums out there and I'm saying that sincerely. I've already said in this video, I like my father's world. I think my father's world has a lot of activities, however, and it could feel overwhelming to you. So if you're using sort of a boxed curriculum like that, that's gonna give you everything for every subject, I would just tell you, don't be afraid to cut things out. The curriculum is to help you. It is not to be like your master. What did you like most? about the early years of homeschooling and what did you like the least? Mm. I think what I liked the most about the early years of homeschooling was the simplicity of it all and the wonder of it all. And after my first year anyway, not feeling like a big failure if I didn't get through my task list for the day because I knew that my kids were young and I knew that eventually we were going to get to it and that I didn't have to teach them, you know, all the countries and capitals of the entire world by the time they were third grade. I just have always been somewhat of a laid back homeschooler in that way. And I won't say that I won't, don't stress out about some things, but I think I'm pretty laid back when it comes to their education because I just know children are naturally curious and they're natural learners and I'm really kind of just offering things to my children to see what their interests are and then once I see an interest I might help them explore that interest more because to me whatever your children is is meant to be that's what I'm looking for so my son just recently put together his own computer he built his own computer so I'm trying to offer him things geared more towards technology because, well, maybe that's what he's going to end up doing someday. So even when they're younger, you're just offering them a feast of things and seeing what they're naturally geared to. And you can, you have a lot more freedom when, when you're younger, I can, when your kids are younger. I can't say that I necessarily fully appreciated that in our early years of homeschool, but it is absolutely true just explore and feed their curiosity and their imagination what i disliked about the early years of their homeschooling was they could not be as independent so it was harder to give them tasks to do without me having to be there so i did feel a little bit more like a referee all day long trying to bounce between everybody, but that is why I went with classical conversations, honestly, because I decided I really need something that I can do mostly with them all together. And classical conversations really fit that mold for us for four years. The foundation memory work program was pretty much all we did to fill in for history and science and even art. I didn't do any of that stuff at home. So while we did classical conversations, all I did was the memory work. And our community day was just a big day full of all kinds of music and science experiments. And that's where we did the art projects and we got our friend time in. But at home, all I worried about was math and language arts and it was glorious. <laughs> it was gloriously simple until my son was in junior high and it got a lot more complex so you moms with with younger kids it may feel like a lot now and like maybe when they start being independent that it will be a lot easier I can't say that one is easier than another they are different <laughs> okay so what what I did not like what I liked the least about the early years of homeschooling besides feeling like a referee at times because they needed me for everything that they did 
was having a toddler, being having constant interruptions like that. It was a challenge to me who would, who would have liked to get all of our schoolwork done in this boxed time period. So while I'm laid back in some ways and flexible in some ways, in other ways, I like things the way that I like them. So take that as you will. But I also think that the early years of homeschooling, I loved reading the picture books. I, I like the excitement that the kids had. And I think now having a high schooler and a teenager now, and my teenager having some motivational issues, I am appreciating in my nine-year-old the fact that she's still excited about learning and still open to a good story and wanting to sit on my lap and read some picture books, whereas now my 13-year-old is, oh, that's babyish or that's not cool or that's dumb. That's kind of the attitude shift that I'm seeing here. And even my high schooler, I was telling him this morning, I'm going to make it next year where you can do all the read alouds with us. Or, you know, I'm going to make sure you have your first semester's work done by December so you can do enjoy all the Christmas schooling with us. And even he was kind of like, hmm, just kind of over some of the fun things. So while your kids are young, you can have all the snuggles and all the fun with the fun books and going to the library bringing home a bunch of books was a lot more fun when they were young when they were younger and it's just different now when they're older they're more mature some of that wonder is waning a bit and it's changing but it's also cool in other ways because they can enjoy movies that i enjoy now i mean i don't really want to watch cartoons unless it's looney tunes i i love looney tunes but you know now they can enjoy a good musical that's not a cartoon with me where you know I don't have to watch a Disney movie with them every single time we want to sit down and watch a movie. So there's pros and cons to younger kids and older kids. Okay, so somebody else said what curriculums did I use in my early years of homeschooling? And I th I think I might have answered this. I used My Father's World for kindergarten, but we also used My Father's World for third grade. So that was our very first year homeschooling. And it was a, a great way to start because it was a boxed curriculum and it had all kinds of fun activities. I also, it was a lot and I always felt like I was behind because I wasn't completing it all. But I still, I liked the program, it's just that I found classical conversations and I really wanted a community. I had a few friends who were using My Father's World and My Father's World has an idea, I never was able to fully look into it, but it was called Synergy Groups. And I think that's like if you find families around you who use My Father's World that you could use be on the same year. So for example, they have a family cycle that's, that's either second, through eighth grade or, or third grade through eighth grade, but it's called the family cycle. If you get all your friends or your group to be on the same year as you, then you could meet together for a co-op, and it's kind of a similar idea as classical conversations. The people that I tossed that idea out to, though, did not seem interested, and at that time, I was like, well, I want community more than I want this curriculum. So I started searching for something else and I looked into classical conversations and was like, this is what I want. And I chose it more for the community than the curriculum, although I was very intrigued by the classical, classical model. But I did it more for the weekly community and everybody doing the same thing so that as you have questions, these moms have used those curriculums before. They know they've done this before. They, they were a huge help. And the first two years in classical conversation was phenomenal. And why we left and the pros and cons, well, you can, I got videos about that if you wanna know more about classical conversations. Any videos that I've mentioned, by the way, in here will be linked below down in the description. Okay, and so you know what? I just realized the last question here is how I set up my kids' homeschool binders, and that's not really something that I can answer here, but that is a video that will be coming in the new year because I am gonna do a video on my students' organization 
at some point, some point early. I have so many video ideas, you guys. It's not even funny <laughs> how many videos I already have scripted. And I, when I, I'm not lying, I think I have 20 or 30 videos already scripted that I may never get around to because just because they're already scripted doesn't mean like tonight I won't have another phenomenal idea and write it down right away because that's what that's how I do it and so sometimes I do videos that I didn't even have planned like this one it was kind of a last minute because I thought why you guys are wrapping presents you might want to just listen to my voice and pretend like we're hanging out in the same room and you don't have to watch me so I hope that that is the experience that you have with this video. That was all the questions. If you guys have any more questions for me, leave them below. I answered a lot more questions last year too about homeschooling. And then if you need some homeschool inspiration in general to like mix it up or you feel like you're in a rut, check out this playlist right here. And until next time, bye.